Good to see each everyone. Have a, have a good week, everyone. Did you have a good week? That's the Minnesota thing right there. Yep, you betcha. Yeah. <laughs> Got to love it. Uh, one of our leaders, he, uh, he says, this is how I am, I'm excited. This is how I am when I'm excited. A true Minnesotan. What, what is it about us? They say deep waters, or you know, calm waters run deep. What do you mean? Well, you don't know how we always know how to read people for sure. You really get to know with them. I found the best way to get to know a person really is to work side by side. I don't know how much better it gets, or maybe you go fishing. Maybe there's this spanning quality kind. There's something about you really don't get to know a person until you maybe went through some conflict. Now don't get too excited on me. Do you think that God's people ever have conflict? Oh boy. We're all in a process of, if we come to Jesus, for some of us, we started young. For some of us, we started later. For as long as you started some, that's, that's what the most important thing. I, and, and Hebrews was going to bring us down to this. We're in the 10th chapter today. But in, by the time we get to the 12th chapter, it talks about a race, and it's not a race to win. Oh, I, I won first place. It's not about that. It's about finishing. It's about staying the course. It's not how you started in the race, it's how you finished. That's life. Our life is like a race. And no matter where you've entered into this race, no matter what season you're in your life, as long as you got started and as long as you finish, that's what's important. Having said all that, we're going to go back to chapter 10. Uh, we're actually going to review a little bit of 8 and 9 because it helps us kind of know what, what we're getting into. 8 and 9, we dealt with the cleansing power of Jesus, the protecting power of Jesus, and the saving power of Jesus by the blood of the Lamb. Nothing we can do to purchase our salvation, amen, because Jesus' blood shed was the agent. His life was the price that was paid, that needed the only way for us to receive forgiveness and cleansing is the blood of Jesus. Old Testament, sacrifice that were required merely covered the sin. Jesus' blood that was shed takes away the sin. Amen. When John the Baptist was baptizing, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, right? He takes away the sin of God. And so, let's not forget the power of the blood of Jesus. To pray, and we uh, got a hold of a phrase I know growing up, and it's not, not, it's not every church that used this phrase, but somehow it came down through the community of the Christian church was the, the, the phrase, I plead the blood of Jesus. What does that mean? Pleading the blood of Jesus has to do with applying the blood of Jesus into your situation. Applying the blood of Jesus is recognizing Jesus, what he has done for you and I on the cross, and saying, we have the power. Satan, you have no dominion in my life. In the name of Jesus, be gone. 
You have the authority by the blood of the Lamb to pray a protection over your children, over your grandchildren, over your household, over your community, even your workplace. Why not let us go forward and begin to knock down the things that the enemy is trying to put up? Jesus said, I will build my church, right? What did he say after that? The gates of hell shall not prevail against us. This idea of holding on until Jesus comes is not biblical. The idea is this. We are made more than conquerors. The devil is more afraid of you. Amen? The devil is afraid of the blood of Jesus because he cannot penetrate. And so when you walk in that, you can have that victory. And I know sometimes he wants to get us discouraged to think that we are no good. Amen? He gets us to think that we are worthless and get us to think that we have no partnership with our Lord. You see, this is the Old Testament. We will read a little bit from chapter 10 now. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the things to come, and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. Wouldn't that be a drag? I'm going to church now, but I'm going to be reminded of my sins. Oh, my goodness. The good news is that Jesus came. I'm going to get to that. Let me read on. Verse 4, And it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body that thou hast prepared for me in whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. Thou hast taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the roll of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And after saying, Sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast not desired, nor thou take pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do thy will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second, by this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And that's where we get our title. Once for all. Once sacrifice for all sin forever. Now I need to get to the side. I wish you could say that everything in this life was permanent, but it's not. I don't even know if I want everything in this life to be permanent. Why do you say that? Well, because in this life you will have trouble, right? There's enough trouble. But heaven is a place without trouble because God is there. And where God is, there is real life and truth. God comes to save. Satan comes to destroy. He is working overtime, he says. He knows his time is short. The Bible says that Satan will be put away for a season at the end time. He will be uh, put in a pit and held for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, he's released for a while, and then he's finally thrown into the lake of fire forever and forever. He knows all about that. He knows his days are numbered. But I'm not here today to lift up Satan. I'm here today to lift up the name of Jesus. Because where Jesus is, that's where we want to be. Where Je what Jesus is up to, that's what we want to be a part of. What is Jesus up to today? Because he shed his blood, because he gave his life, he has given us a life of eternity. And eternity starts now. Hello? 
Eternity starts at the moment you come in connection and you, your faith begin to connect with the Lord Jesus and you begin to believe. Now, wherever that's happened, some of us know the place and some of us, we grew into it. Some of us, we just, you know, maybe it was an invitation. But wherever you've started, as long as you've got started. And so number one, as we read on from the text, and we skip down to verse 19 after we read these verses up to 12. Since therefore, he loves the, the, the writer of Hebrews loves the word therefore. Right? We see it so many times. Therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place of the blood of, by the blood of Jesus. Notice that. The confidence, number one in our, our, our message, Confidence comes through the blood of Jesus. Confidence comes because of the cross and resurrection of Christ. Hebrews 4.16, just a few chapters back in the book of Hebrews, invites us to come, draw near with what? Confidence. In other words, you're coming to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're coming to the God of the universe and you're just coming in there with boldness. That's, he invites us. Why? Because we have the blood of Jesus. And you're protected. And you may receive mercy and help of time of need. Now what it, was it about the new church? What was it about the apostles? Well, you say they were the apostles. They, were, they followed Jesus. They weren't do doing so well after Jesus' death. They weren't doing so well. You remember the story. They were hiding out, right? Why were they? Well, they were afraid for their own lives. There wasn't much confidence. Peter struggled, and he, of course, Jesus told them that you were going to deny me. And Jesus, uh, Peter said, oh, yes. oh, no, 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 I'll die. I'll die for you. And he was speaking out of his emotion, but he had not yet received the power of the Holy Spirit. So new church, new, new, new Testament church started out by them experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit because they waited on the Lord, because they took Jesus' words literally and said, we're going to stay, we're not going to go out and try to preach, we're not going to go out and try to evangelize until we receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. So in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 13, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. I love this. They were uneducated and untrained men, yet they recognized them as having been with Jesus. Friends, when we spend time with Jesus, people will notice. You're different. You're able to have self-control more. You're able to live more at peace. You're able to have more joy. You're able to do what the natural man, so to speak, as the scripture declares, in the natural we are not able to accomplish anything. But those who will abide in the vine, John's gospel, talks about this relationship that we have with Jesus because without Jesus living in us and he comes into our hearts and the Holy Spirit is the, the person of the Godhead who lives in our hearts through Jesus. And we dwell together and we communicate together and he's living through you. How many want Jesus to live through you? You want Jesus to be with you when you walk out of this place today? And you want Jesus to walk with you when you go into your home. And you need Jesus when you go to your workplace. And that's the way it's meant to be. The confidence that we have is not in ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 and 5 reads such as this, such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. And we know this for sure, that without God, we will flat on our face. When I try to do it in my own strength, 
when I try to take it into my own hands, I can only make things worse. But if I will let the Lord Jesus Christ be my God and say, I humble myself before you, Lord. If you will lead me, help me to follow you. If you're putting it in my heart to say something, may I have the boldness to say it, the confidence to speak it out. I was not very confident growing up. A shy kid. Just terrified to give a speech in school. I mean terrified. My first speech lasted about 15 seconds. It was supposed to go a minute or two. I mean, I felt my face burning. It was red. I was embarrassed. This was miserable. That was me in about seventh, eighth grade. This shyness kind of goes with my nature. But there was a moment when it, God helped me. Number one, when he came into my heart as a boy. But it wasn't until the power of the Holy Spirit came on me on a, on a youth service at my home church in Aiken. And many of the young people were up at the altars praying. And they were getting touched by God. And I was afraid to go up because I didn't want it. I didn't want you know, that's, that's, that's really radical. And then it was one of the leaders of the young people. As soon as I made one step, he was like, drug me. <laughs> and they all piled on praying for this shy kid. Well, let me just say that little by little, God has helped me overcome shyness. Because I know I can't do what he called me to do. I'm left. The Lord is with me. And so I figure it's this way. In my weakness, Paul said, he is made strong. In your weakness, he is made strong. Maybe you're not as strong in some areas as you'd like to be, but you can rest assurance if you will call upon the Lord. I believe you can have the gifts of the Holy Spirit in life. Where there are nine of them, you know, there are nine gifts. You ever heard of them? Nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, knowledge, uh, miracles, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues. There's nine gifts. And how would you like to have all nine of them? I don't know if that's what God wants, but at least the one that you need at the time you need it. Have you ever needed the gift of wisdom? Of course, I'm sure you have. Have you ever needed the courage to step out out of your comfort zone? You're not used. This is the. This is whoa. This doesn't feel easy. But God, the Holy Spirit, is so good. That he starts with you where you're at. And he wins you over, little by little. He never forces you. He never tries to embarrass you. But he brings you to a place where he turns your heart around. And this is exactly what was going on in Old Testament days. They would bring their sacrifices basically out of duty, and their hearts were getting colder and further away from God. As long as they felt, well, we got our sins covered for the year, now well, we got the whole rest of the year to go whatever. The word, what does it say? This covenant is a new covenant. This covenant that he's making is going to be a relationship with Jesus. And now you're not going to only just know what's right and wrong, you're going to want to do what's right. Because your heart is in the right place. 
And this, may I say, is the core issue in our world. Our whole world has a heart problem. What is it? Without God, our heart cannot be what he's intended. We can't even make it a step. But thanks be to God. Remember reading in Romans, Paul was describing the struggle that was going on in Romans chapter 6 or 7. He describing he knew what was right to do, but he was having tr- trouble finding uh, the strength to do it. And he went on to talk about the law and the weaknesses of the law. And then he goes on into chapter 8. Now there's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ. Christ has set us free from the law of sin. What is it? The law of sin and death. Death uh, physically is in our world because of sin. We know that. But also, if, if we choose to sin, we can have a separation from God until we deal with the sin. And that's the good news. You mean to tell me, even though I sin over and over again, God still loves me? Yeah. You mean to tell me, if I fall down in this race, that if I get up again, he's going to help me again? Yeah. You mean I have to forgive my brother seven times seven and seventy, you know, on and on? Yeah. Because Jesus has done that for you and I. And he will continue to do it as long as you turn the heart. You can go on your own way for a while. You can pretend that things are going to go great, and all of a sudden, bam. You realize that you need to go back. And that's a good thing because the Holy Spirit doesn't give up. And so we pray, Lord, help us. One of the things that's so important is that we run back to God. Run to God instead of run away from God. And he's there, a confidence. You know how Satan works? Is this way. To get us to think we're not good enough to go back to God. He's got us. He's got us by condemnation. He gets us to think, well, you're just an embarrassment. You're just making a fool out of yourself. He'll, he'll tell us all kinds of things. And we've got to be, we've got to turn our hearts toward the Lord. We've got to be in the Word, don't we? Because this Word is, is basically a sword that helps us cut our way through this life. Psalm 3, verse 25, 26. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor of the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. You know how the enemy works? He wants to put fear in your heart. Fear from going to the Lord. Fear what others think. Well, the Lord will be your confidence in this psalm and keep your foot from being caught. Secondly, a confession of our hope, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. What are we confessing? What is the confession of our hope? The confession is partly is that Jesus Christ is the Lord. In fact, Philippians describes that one day every knee shall bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to be confessing Jesus is Lord right now. I don't want to be forced to do that. That needs to come from my heart. That should come from my heart. That should be easy to say, Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are on the throne. But in the end time, it seems to suggest that every knee is going to bow. I want to take you to a few verses in 1 John. It has to do with spiritual, I guess we call it spiritual battle. 
Well, we know that there is a spiritual battle. How many know there's a spiritual battle going on in, in heavily right now? In First John's that little book is full of truth. In chapter four, John says this: "Beloved, do not believe every spirit." Now, listen. This is powerful because we live in a spiritual world. But not every spirit is from God. Right? Not every spirit's good. So, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit. So, how do we test the spirit? To see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That's power. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. A lot of folks would maybe try to figure out, who's the Antichrist? Who's the Antichrist? I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I mean, I... I'm skeptical of people who think they've figured it out. I get a little skeptical, but I see there's a spirit of Antichrist in the world. What does that mean? There are, is opposition against Jesus Christ. Period. Because when we stand in the name of the Lord, the enemy is threatened. If he has to give up any territory, he retaliates. And so we have to learn to watch a so-called prophet, a preacher, a teacher. We have to compare what he's saying to the written word of God. If it doesn't line up, we have reason to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. God would never contradict himself or conceal us. But we're living in days where there's so much you can get information. I'm just saying this. We can't believe everything we see on the gadgets. Just just pray through it. And I think, you know. To be informed is good, but sometimes all if that becomes all that we want is information, information, information. We start to get confused. What is the Lord saying? I'm just saying this for my own sake. I need I need quite a bit of quiet time. I'm just built that way because I need to know that you, Lord. And it wasn't until Moses stepped. And God got his attention by the burning bush, but it wasn't God didn't speak to Moses. His tension, his tension was there. It's interesting. And so the the church needs to know who their hope is. When you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord, that opens up the heavens. Declares him ruler. Another one of my friends said this Satan can't read your mind, so thou you need to talk out loud and declare the things of God. How good is that? Declare scripture. Because when Satan hears that, he's, he's okay, okay. I'll try another day. Confession of your hope. What did Paul mean when he spoke to Romans? When he was dealing with salvation, he said these verses, Romans 10, 9, and 10, and they're very popular in the church when it comes to salvation. But it says this, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, this is Romans 10, 9, and believe in your heart. Notice how confession with your mouth and belief in your heart go together. It's not merely just an intellectual thing, well, I confess you are Lord. But no, I mean it with all my I believe what you've done for me on the cross. I thank you. And I confess you as Lord. 
God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's God's promise. That's God's word. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. It's not only the death, it's the resurrection. It's the resurrection power that gives us the victory of our hope. That's why we can have hope if we die in this world, we live eternally with him. Good news, isn't it? If this was all there was, this little lifespan, what a gloom and doom would it be. But many people in our world live with that mindset that just live now. They don't really have an assurance of any kind of life after. Or they're misled or they're mistaught by many deceiving spirits. We can talk to Jesus anytime, day or night. We don't have to make an appointment. How good is that? Day or night. We don't have to call up and make reservations. We try to get in the tough. The Bible says he looks for a heart. Eyes move to his school. Looking for a heart whom he can trust. He looks into your heart and sees potential. He looks into your heart and sees there, there's one who's longing for him who's looking for him. And he sets up circumstances. And he brings us to a place where we can meet him. And then we can know him. So as we go back to the book of Hebrews, we'll pick it up again. The verse or two that we read about, considering how Verse 24, I'll read verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds. We love little kids. They're great. We love that you're here. But consider how to stimulate. There's one translation, I think, King James, that says, provoke one another. That's pretty strong. Provoke. Prod. What does that mean? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Because earlier in the text, earlier in the book of Hebrews, he warned against people that were drifting in their faith. They were casual about it. And you know what happens if we're casual about our faith? We cool off a little bit. We become a little less in our witness. It becomes a little harder to pray. It becomes a little harder to have a good attitude when we struggle without Jesus. I know I do. And so, what? What is the answer to staying up? He answers it. Not forsaking our own assembling together. Verse 25. Notice how he says, as is the habit of some. So what he's saying, he's speaking to a group of people that he, he's been observing, that he's been a part of, and he's noticed that some have, have drifted. And he's calling them back to the relationship of the hope I see everyone here, verse 25, everyone understands and the need of encouraging or being encouraged. Everyone, why is that even in the Bible? Because God knows we're going to need encouragement. God knew you, 
from the day you were, even before you were formed, as Jeremiah talks about in chapter 1, I knew you and I've called you. Right? But he also knows that there's an enemy in this world that wants to destroy you. And he, he is there for you praying as Jesus is our intercessor. And when you accepted him into your heart, does not mean that now all your problems just went away. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is he saved you out of your sin, so now you can have him to walk in this world and this earth. And you will have trouble, Jesus said. Let's not be misled. Well, we say, well, I must be doing something wrong. God must be mad at me. He's mad over you. He longs for you to enter in and say, I trust you. Even though I feel like I'm not what I ought to be, and might as well just admit it, I'm not what I ought to be, but you are, and you are in me, I believe, and I want you, and he just dwells there. There's so many people, I heard this from my, my college pastoral professor. He'd say this from time to time. So many people in the church feel they're never good enough. He talked to that. He talked to the, the upcoming young pastor. Something stuck. And college was one of those times. This same professor spoke at my home church. I think I helped get that set up. He spoke at a fellowship. That was young, 25 ish. Going to Bible school, thinking, well, Lord, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Afraid a little bit of what maybe God would tell me. He just looks at me and says, you'll be a pastor. Consider how to stimulate one another. to. You know what we need to do is believe in people. Believe, believe in each other. Believe, see something of potential. God sees you in his potential, through his life. God sees the potential that you and I have through his all-knowingness. No matter where you're at today, it's never too late to start afresh with a new one. The good news is this. Every day is a chance. Another chance to serve Him. And to consider, what is my purpose in life? What is my God-given thing? Number one, don't make it hard. Love God. Well, that's easy. Love God. Choose Him. Make Him number one. So that you can say, Lord, I mean it. Not only Savior, but Lord. We keep coming back to this. Not what I can do. But what you can do, do. Not what I can do, not what I'm supposed to do for you, but what you're going to do. We get them reversed. What does Jesus want to do in your life? You can only. It'll take, it will take the rest of your life. Sometimes we're still trying to figure out what we're supposed to do in our life. But we don't. We can't mess it up too much if we say, God, I'm going to love you. And if that means I work there, I'll work there, I'll go there. 
I'll work with my hands. I'll do whatever it takes. As long as you call me to wherever it may be, I'm going to be there. And I'm going to get out of bed in the morning. Even sometimes I don't feel like it, and the body hurts, and whatever. And the list is a mile long. I have to learn to put on the Lord Jesus and take him with me into the world. This world is passing away. But there's a hope. There's an assurance that we can walk in confidence because we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And with his help, we can consider how to bring others with us. It's not about just you. And I end with one more verse. A little verse taken out of Philippians chapter 2. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. That's a skill, I think. Learning how to be interested in others, ask questions, be interested in what they do. Put yourself somewhere else. Because we want to win people. We want to notice when people are down. Notice why their countenance may be down. You know what? We're all going to have moments. So if we know a friend, or if we have a family member, and we notice they're down, we, but something should stir us to say, you know what? What's going on? What's going on? In the church. The church needs to be a safe place. The church body should be a safe place. Well, we can say, I, I need prayer. I need, I need your support. We've got some things going on. So we're going to come to a place right where you're at today, right every situation it may be. I know this, and I look back. I look back to the history of the Scripture. And over and over, God has been faithful to Israel. And God will continue to be faithful to Israel. But there's also the Gentile race, which is you and I. We have become God's people. We have been adopted, Romans talks about. We are sons and daughters also. And we are, we are to be praying for Israel, especially as you heard do. And we need to be praying for our family. We need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in the war that we will continue to stay faithful. Finish strong so to speak, in the race. This little song that, that uh, come along here, I don't know, it's been a few years. I'm just getting to learn to know it. I've been number one song for a long time in the church, the blue court. The goodness of God. And when we sing this, I want you to think how good God is. How good he's been to you. Think back maybe over your life. How good he was, has been 